You're listening to Glove Up or Shut Up on the Angry Marks Podcast Network. You're listening to Glove Up or Shut Up on AngryMarks.com with Peter H. and Stevie J. Find them on Twitter at HardcoreCDN and at Angry Marks. And now, for all the news, reviews, and interviews in mixed martial arts, it's time for Glove Up or Shut Up from AngryMarks.com. And welcome, everybody, to another episode of Glove Up or Shut Up, right here at AngryMarks.com. My name is Peter H. I'm joined once again by my co-host from Omaha, Nebraska, CBJ. With intestinal fortitude and an iron will, I'm here for another show. Peter, how are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm almost afraid to ask about iron will at this point. Well, you shouldn't be, because it was a really good show. Although there was a very controversial fight during the prelims that if you didn't already see the video of, you're going to want to go look at it after we get done with this show. Absolutely. Now, we're going to talk about, well, actually, there were no shows this past week, and there are no shows this upcoming week. It's a rare (laughs) back-to-back, quiet time. You You say that like I just didn't talk about One Fighting's Iron Will show. There was a fight last week. Well, no, what I was going to say was, no shows last week, no shows this week. I think this is the only time on the schedule the entire year, so soak it up, man. Well, if you're talking about Bellator and UFC, okay, but that doesn't mm-hmm. mean there weren't other things happening in the world. That's all I'm trying to no, say. No, but we're hardcores, and I'm just speaking from a casual fan perspective. Well, yes, but if you're listening to this show, you're probably slightly on the hardcore end of just the spectrum. Yeah. So you probably watched a show like Iron Will, which was a pretty damn good show. And you know what? People who are listening to this, I'm going to tell you right now, if you've never watched a one fighting show, they're only 10 bucks, and the stream quality is flawless. If you've never dabbled in these waters before, pick a show with a few names that you recognize, throw down a tenor, and enjoy yourself. Now... Of the highlights on this show, what was what really stood out to you? Well, I got to start with the teased prelim fight because I saw an incredible over the back suplex by Kritsada Kongsrichai, where he spiked Robin Catalan right on his head and won the fight, or so we thought, because. The announcers, Mitch Chilson and Michael Chavello, were like, I don't know, man. It looks like he came down on his head. That's illegal in one fighting. So they're talking about it. They can't make up their minds. Kung Sir Chai is announced the winner of the fight. After the event, one officials looked at the replay, and previously they had believed that Catalan's hand or elbow had touched the mat before his head, but when they looked at the reverse angle and saw that his head came down first, they disqualified Kong's Rachai, and Catalan is your winner of the fight via disqualification from a slam into ground and pound. Or in other words, an illegal suplex. Yes, it was definitely an illegal suplex. In WWE, it would have been just another day for Brock Lesnar, but in this fight, he spiked the guy right on his head. Or an NWA would be a souple. <laughs> yes, whatever you want to say, suplex or souple. Now, this wasn't the only, um, how do I put this, newsworthy moment of the show. Uh, there's a moment here that caught a lot more attention. There's several newsworthy moments. One of them would be jujitsu ace Gary Tonin, Mm -hmm. who had never before had a mixed martial arts rules fight, coming in against the experienced one-fighting veteran Richard Corminal. And my theory, and believe me, a lot of people's theory going into this fight was, how long is it going to take before Gary Tonin wrestles him to the ground, puts him in an arm bar, and taps him out. That's not what happened. Gary no. Tonin went out there and unloaded with his hands, and he rocked Richard Criminal in the first round. And, okay, I'm thinking, yeah, he softened him up, now we can take him down and finish him. Nope. He decided he was going to just 
keep on swinging away until he knocked Corminal down and pounded him out on the ground. The people's elbow. That's true. I saw, I saw some people referring to I was like, wait, what show are we watching right now? Like, people's <laughs> elbow in 2018? Okay. Yeah, he did actually drop an elbow on it, so I can't, I can't dispute that description. Now, I mean... I'll be honest, there were a few shows going on over the past weekend, like like one and LFA, but it's hard when you have a dedicated Twitter for MMA and you have a lot of different people making wrestling references at the same time, and you're like, wait, what's going on? A suplex? A people's elbow? We're going to talk about a backflip in a second, but what the hell, man? Like, it's like, no one's watching. Let's be crazy. I don't know what this is. Yeah, it was a... Uh... Pretty eventful weekend for a non-Bellator, non-UFC weekend. Let's just put it that way. Now, what was more devastating, Meowd or uh, Ritha? How do you say it? Shannon Varachi? Varachi. Both won their fights by knockout, and both were. Oh, they were good. They were almost uncomfortable to watch. It was vicious. Okay, I'm. I'm gonna rate these since you just asked me which one was more devastating. Yeah. Now Varachi's was impressive because of the rapidity with which it took place. It only took him 21 seconds to absolutely floor Rahul Raju. He just went lights out when Warachi landed this punch. And for it to happen that fast was totally unexpected. But the Jeremy Miata one was even bigger. I'll tell you why. Reason number one, Miata was coming in off two straight losses. Reason number two, Omnusiri Choke, or Dej for short, that's his nickname. Dej is a Muay Thai veteran, and I don't say that word lightly. His combined Muay Thai record is 282 wins versus 65 losses. So this guy is an ace of aces when it comes to the art of eight limbs. He is a striking master. And he is the former strawweight champion of one fighting. So most people were thinking, okay, Miano's coming in off a couple of losses, and Dej is going to reinsert himself into the title picture with a big win. That's the exact opposite of what happened. And this hook that Miano hit Dej with, oh my <laughs> lord. I, I swear to you, and I am not exaggerating, you can look up the video for yourself. When he yeah. landed this thing, Dej, his chin was straight up in the air, and he hit it, and the man went rigid. He immediately, stiff as somebody doing a plank, he went rigid and fell straight back, thud, hit the canvas. I was like, oh my god, did he just kill him? I was, for a second there, I thought, that's not good. But, Dej recovered. He got up. He got back on his stool. Oh, man. But to see a guy get knocked out like that is not something you necessarily want to see. That was a vicious, vicious hook. That was... It... I think my first reaction is, like, when I saw it, I... I because when you watch Feisty, you have to, you know, we've talked about this before. You, in your head, you, 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 you say one thing and you usually don't blurt it out because usually when you cover fights, you're not supposed to react at press row. So I've gotten in the habit of not really blurting out anything. Even when I'm alone in the house, I'll still just keep it to myself. I might, you know, for something crazy, I might say something. But when it was this, that sickening thud that you spoke of, I think I blurted it out the fuck did I just watch? The only reason that I didn't yell any louder is because I was watching the fights on a Saturday morning and my wife was upstairs asleep. So if I yelled really loud, she'd be like, what the hell? What's going on? Everything's fine. Go back to bed. Yeah, right. Exactly. Um, so, it, it, and, and, and it's worth noting, if I didn't already say this, that I'm the Siri Choke, a.k.a. Dej, was actually pressing the action when this happened. This was a counter shot. <laughs> that makes it even better. Yeah. So he was he was coming forward when he got creamed. Yikes. 
Yeah, that's that's the best way to say it. We should mention another fight though. Uh, it happened for the Access TV fights. Um, controversial would be an understatement. Oh, you're going to talk about the backflip, but yeah, I, I can't. I I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I can't let it go without talking about the main event of one. Oh, right, the five round main. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, Viviano Fernandez defending the title. Considered by some to be the pound-for-pound best bantamweight in the world, maybe among the top five pound-for-pound fighters in one fighting, but definitely top five in bantamweights among the world. And he has a long, I mean, ridiculously long streak of wins. I'm going to see how far back it goes. I'm looking at it right now. From this year all the way back to September 24th, 2011 at Dream 17, that's how long this guy's gone without taking a loss. He's a multiple-time World Jiu-Jitsu gold medalist. He is a, a just a fearsome fighter overall. But Martin Wynn is a two-weight class champion. He is the featherweight and the lightweight champion. He was trying to become the first ever three-weight class simultaneous champion in mixed martial arts. He went out there. He had a hell of a fight with Viviano Fernandez. Now, one person I talked to said that he actually felt like Martin Wynn was ahead going into the fifth round. I'm not so sure if I concur. My thinking was that Nguyen was the aggressive fighter, and credit to him for that because you're fighting one of the best bandweights in the world and making him earn it every step of the way. But when I saw Bibiano land, I thought he was landing the better, cleaner, harder shots. And one fighting uses the scoring system much akin to pride where they judge the fight as a whole and not necessarily individual rounds. You don't give 10, nine rounds or shit like that. So I'm watching the fifth round and Bibiano starts to turn it up, especially in the last 90 seconds. And he's really putting on a striking performance. And I'm thinking to myself, if this was UFC scoring, I'd give that three to two. If it's one fighting scoring, I score him the winner of the fight as a whole, because he was already like 50, 50. And then he turned it on at the end. So in my mind, Bibiano won the fight. Somebody else I talked to thinks Martin Wynn won the fight. So what do you think happened when the judges scored the fight? I'm scared to ask. Well, they read it off this way in one fighting. Judge number one gives the fight to the red corner. (laughs) Judge number two gives the fight to the blue corner. And your third judge gives the fight to the winner, and still one fighting bantamweight world champion, Viviano Fernandez. So he hung on to the title by split decision. To me, the right call. To other people, they disagree. You have to watch the fight and decide for yourself. All right, now... Let's move on to LFA because, as I said before, the (laughs) backflip was, um, let's just say this guy wasn't the favorite of a few fighters on Twitter afterwards. It was one of the rudest things I have ever seen a fighter do. The, I forget the fight, you're going to have to correct me. I'm sure I know a few people online that are going to correct me after this, but who was the fighter who did the uh, Pokeball finisher after he won the fight where he pretended to throw a ball to... You know, got to catch them all and, you know, capture the Maybe opponent that almost. Was Michael Venom Page when he hit a flying yes. knee. This guy, I mean, that is fun. That you're not, you're not touching the opponent. You're just basically, you're not as bad as T2 Ortiz. You're not digging imaginary dirt on your opponent. This guy, after knocking him out, stood on his back and did a backflip. Yeah, the fighter's name is Drew Chapman, just in case any of you are wondering, oh. because you hadn't mentioned that fact yet. Right. It, it, I, I heard about it first, and I was like, come on, you guys are making it up. And then I saw the video, and I'm like, huh, that's not going to go well. He might, and then it turns out, yeah, he did get disqualified for his post-fight antics. 
He yep. lost the fight. He cost himself money mm-hmm. yep. by being a dumbass. Yep. All of his uh, <laughs> winner's purse goes to his opponent, Irvin Zayala. Sorry, I couldn't pay. I did a backflip. Like, uh, no. That's you know, just stupid. I didn't even bother to look it up, but thinking about it again as I'm rereading this and looking at that gif one more time, I wonder if he's related to Javi Ayala. That's a good question. I couldn't Might answer be. that. I mean, that's Could a hell be. of a coincidence. You know, every other time we've ever talked about this, like, when we talked about the BB brothers, it was like, yeah, they gotta be brothers. That can't be a coincidence, and it turned out they were. <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, the Miller brothers, almost. Yeah, exactly. Fighting just runs in some families. Alright, so... Let's move on to the news, because we got a shit ton to get through this week. Um, I, I want to start with a fight announcement here, but um, I, I I can't believe I'm going to say this before I even talk about that. What do you think of Invicta's ring boy? Well, if you're going to have an all-female fighting promotion, you might as well have a ring boy, since in an all-male promotion, you have ring girls. But you know who I'm talking about, who was the ring boy. I honestly don't remember. Elias Teradu. Well, of course. He <laughs> is a professional model. I... <laughs> Nothing I, wrong I, with that. He's no, a handsome dude. No, it's just... I'm comfortable enough that... in my sexuality to say that is a damn good-looking man. Oh, yeah. I know. I've seen him in person. I've talked to him. He's a nice guy. It's just... There's a picture of him holding the belt with the two, like the main event fight for the championship, and he's got the grin on his face. And I'm thinking, okay, let's let's do this. I I just never thought it would happen. I guess I don't know. I just it was different, and different's good. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. Um, so we're gonna peel back the curtain a little bit for this next story because Stevie and I we chat almost on a daily basis when it comes to MMA. Um. Somebody's getting an interim title shot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's happening in Brazil. Mm-hmm. <laughs> His name is Colby Covington. Oh, you better hire extra security. It better not be Australian security. Um, oh, no, definitely not. I just, uh, from the comments Covington made in the past about Brazilians. Yeah, we, calling the country a dump and saying the people are filthy animals is liable to get him executed the moment he steps off the plane. I've only made this joke twice before. Once was for the UFC in Montreal that we attended, and once was when Chael Sonnen went to Brazil to fight Anderson Silva. They'd better have a chopper on standby if he wins that fight. Yeah, they they need all the muscle they can get. I mean, at this point, hire Mr. T, for God's sakes. You need some extra help. It's it's an interesting interim title fight. He's facing Rafael Dos Anjos. Not exactly a pushover. On no. paper, it's a good fight. Yeah. Location? Location would favor Dos Anjos, Anjos, but that doesn't prove anything. No, but you know he's going to have a little bit extra uh, ju- jump in his step, so to speak. Oh, yeah. I'm sure he will be fighting like it's the greatest day of his life. It'll probably be the best moment of his career since he won the lightweight title way back. Oh, man. It's going to be a good fight, and we'll probably talk about more upcoming, but it was just announced. Uh, speaking of announcements, uh, Jilaton, uh the Bellator fighter, uh, she's announced her retirement from both boxing and mixed martial arts. Yeah, effective immediately, which really caught me by surprise. It's, um, I didn't see a reason. Did you see a reason for this, or was it just sudden? Uh, it was pretty damn sudden. I'm going to look for the story again and reread it if you give me a second. Absolutely. While Stevie's looking that up, I do want to announce that LFA 38 does now have a headline fight. In the main event, it'll be for the heavyweight title as Maurice Green tries to steal the title away from Jeff Hughes. So uh, that'll be an interesting main event fight in LFA. And um, Here's the story on MMA fighting. Okay. Uh, Juliton, 14-4-3 in boxing, 2-4 in mixed martial arts. 
has announced on social media she is retiring. I told my promoter it was time for me to move on. As a competitor inside the ring and cage, I'm confident in leaving combat sports fully, knowing there are so many wonderful, passionate, and hardworking women continuing to carry on the torch as a guiding light for the bright future of our arena. Hmm. Okay. Not really saying much. No, it's it's very interesting because I interviewed both her and Heather Hardy before their last fight, and it was supposed to be the first of a two-fight series. They were going to have one fight in MMA and one fight in boxing. Well, obviously, we're never getting the second fight now. No. No, God, no. It's, uh, it's, um, it's just very abrupt, and usually when there's abrupt, there's a reason that they're not announcing it. It's, they're not going to reveal it, and I'm not sure if it's a negative thing or if it's just one of those things where they just don't want to say for the sake of just not saying it. It just seems to me like she's probably hit a brick wall, personally, in investing in fighting anymore. So, if you feel that way and you feel like it's not going to get any better... That's your time to call it a day. I mean, Brendan Schaub made the exact same decision. He got to a certain point as a heavyweight where he felt like, I've done all I can do. I'm never getting any further than this. No. It's probably only downhill from here. I'm just going to call it a day. Yeah, it's it's true. Um, if you call it a day, if, I mean, we, we've talked on this show multiple times about fighters that should. <laughs> and sometimes fighters do the opposite. And even though they really have a lot of gas stuff in the tank, so to speak, they're like, eh, I'm good. I proved it myself. I'm good. Yeah. So I, that's, I always respect that decision to walk away because only a fighter knows how a fighter feels, which coincidentally brings me to a couple of tidbits that I want to mm-hmm. share from my interviews this week because Go ahead. I've talked to Ed Ruth the undefeated collegiate phenom from Penn State who was going to Bellator 196, and when I spoke to him, he didn't even know who his opponent was going to be. Oh, Lord, really? Yeah, because they had booked him for a local Hungarian fighter named Laszlo Furko. But when I called him and I said, so this guy is 6-3, and three, he's blah, blah, this and blah, blah, that. What do you know about him? That's what I know. What do you know? And he's like, well... I know he pulled out of the fight. I was like, oh, that's news to me. So who are you fighting then? He's like, I don't know. They got to find me an opponent. And later on that evening, I got an email from my boss at MMA Mania saying, new opponent for Ed Ruth, catch weight of 175 pounds. And I read the story and I wrote it up. He's fighting a guy named Eon Pascu, who is 17 and 7, and has back-to-back wins in BAMA, the British Association of Mixed Martial Arts. So, coming in on a little bit of a run, but of course he's facing an undefeated collegiate wrestling phenom, so we'll see how that works out for the two of them, but it's a catchweight of 175. Anyway, that wasn't even why I brought up Ed Ruth, because he said something to me that tied back into what we were just talking about, about a fighter knowing when it's time to do what. And he told me that as a fighter, he doesn't worry about being undefeated. He actually thinks about what it would be like to lose and prepares himself for that and knows that he can bounce back from that. And that kind of surprised me because that's not something that I hear a lot of fighters say in interviews with me or with anybody else. So I asked him about that. I said, That's an interesting philosophy because a lot of fighters have said to me, when you think about losing, you've already lost. You're going to lose the fight. And he said, yeah, yeah." and he said, no, man, I don't look at it that way because everybody loses eventually. Nobody stays undefeated. And a lot of guys, I see them, they get on this hype train and they have all this momentum and they think they're hot and then they lose and they don't know what to do with themselves after that. They, they just can't figure it out. I'd rather not be that. I'm not defined by a win or a loss. I'm defined by me. It's like, wow, okay. You just made the case. Ed Ruth, I, you, you convinced me. Your philosophy is just as good as anybody else's. 
it's it's refreshing is what it is. Yeah. In fact, that's a very good word for it. And I don't want to spoil the rest of the interview, so listen to it when it comes out next week on MMA Mania. But I would say Ed Ruth is indeed a very refreshing fighter. And you can follow him on Twitter at EdRuth67. Now, why don't you go to one of your other news stories, and I'll tell you my little tidbit about Benson after that. Okay. Uh, let's go right to the... Um... Oh, man, there's so much here. I'm thinking let's move to... Uh, we talked about that. We talked about that. Okay. Um, Dana White. We believe some of the stuff he says, and it doesn't happen. And then other, the reverse is also true. Hard to. It's hard to decipher. What you're saying is sometimes he's full of shit and sometimes he's not. I'm being very political, but yes. <laughs> um. He's saying the T.J. Dillashaw-Demetrius Johnson fight will not happen. Well, that may be the case right now, but get the right money and get the right offer, and I think it'll happen. Didn't he say the Conor Mayweather fight wouldn't happen at one point? Yeah, he did. Mm. Never say never. I don't never. know. I shouldn't, never have even, I shouldn't have even said never, because I was the one who said that Connor and Mayweather would never happen, and I was dead wrong about that. Yeah, when I sent you that text saying it was on, you, I think your response was, like, F off or BS or something. It was like, no way. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, if you're hunting yeah. for something, I can give you my Benson story. Yeah, go ahead for Benson, because there's something I wanted to mention, but I'm having trouble deciphering my notes right now because I write like a madman sometimes. Go ahead. All right. For the full interview, you're just going to have to go to MMA Mania next week. Teaser. But I can tell you one thing that he said to me in the interview that caught me completely by surprise. He was telling me he had, uh, how do I put this, a, a very eager desire to accept any fight that they would offer him. He was like, I'm ready. I'm ready now. I've been off too long. Give me anybody. And they said, well, we've got a list of names that we're looking to put together a fight with. You could take uh, Brandon Gertz. You could take Michael Chandler. You could take, and the list goes on and on and on. And I hear that, and He tells me he said yes to every single fight they offered him. And then they gave him the fight with Roger Huerta. And I'm I'm thinking to myself, whoa, wait, they offered you Chandler. You said yes, and you're fighting Roger Huerta. What about a rematch with Michael Chandler? There's issues in that fight that you guys didn't settle. He's like, thank you, good sir. I feel the exact same way. So he wants that fight, but they didn't give it to him. Oh, man. So if he knocks out Wirtha, he might get that fight, but wow, well, maybe Chandler turned it down. I don't know. Well, you don't want to speculate, he, so. I, I can't put words in Michael Chandler's mouth, but I can tell you that Benson strongly hinted that Michael Chandler chose his opponent for Bellator 197. Jeez. Okay. So he chose to not fight Benson is the what, the implication. And I will not let you read any further subtext into that. No. Other than you can listen to the interview and read the transcript on MMA Mania next week. Speaking of Bellator, um, Pipple Freire offered to fight Chandler in a five-round fight. Yeah, and the way Pipple is telling it, Chandler is ducking him. Yeah? Well, I mean... I'm sure he's trying to push buttons, but... Now, now we're, we're back to, I want to put words in his mouth, right? So <laughs> right, like, exactly. Um... But Pitbull is definitely coming on strong that Chandler is ducking him. Well, uh, let's move on to UFC 225 in Chicago. Right. Uh, we have another fight announcement here. As, CM uh... Punk! What's that? It's CM Punk, right? No, it's not. Every CM time Punk. we talk about UFC in Chicago, that's always what you say. Mike Santiago's on the card. Oh, okay. Not Mr. Brooks. 
No, Mr. Brooks still doesn't have an opponent, but he's speculated that he will be there. But uh, Dan Ng against Mike Santiago is the, is the new fight added to that card. This card is uh, shaping up to be something fierce, though. Andre Arlovsky tied to Visa, to Vasa, uh, tie to Ivasa. To Ivasa. To Vasa. Rashad Evans in the I Should Retire. I mean, um, Rashad <laughs> Evans against Anthony Smith. <laughs> Curtis Blades, Alistair Overeem, Joseph Benavidez, and Sergio Pettis. Carlos Esparza, Claudia Gadea, and Whitaker Romero for the title. Damn. That is actually one hell of a card. And CM Punk could fight too. You never know. You never know. Um, remember last week we talked about Jake Ellenberger against Bar- Brian Barbarina? What, that fight gets scrapped? Barbarina's been injured. Oh. So, uh, Ellenberger is looking for an opponent. <sighs> that is the curse of cards lately. I told you this off air before we started, but I have rewritten so many drafts of so many Bellator cards because of fights being changed due to injury. It is, it is a nightmare if you're an MMA reporter trying to keep up with the amount of fights that get changed. Well, Speaking of change, Josh Barnett's doing his bit to change some stuff, isn't he? Yeah, he certainly is. He uh, won his appeal against USADA, and he, from what I can understand, um, he's good to go. Yeah, that means he's officially cleared to fight. So, the scary thing is, I mean, the last we saw of him was this past weekend at New Japan when he was uh, doing play-by-play color uh, Color commentary with JR's play-by-play, or I might have reversed that, but... Uh, what you're uh, trying to say is they were calling the action for the Strong Style Evolved show live on Access TV from Long Beach, California. Exactly. And Barnett, um, I wonder if the suspension... I mean, obviously, it's the first time someone's ever done this, so good for him. The system works. If you appeal and, you know, it's a solid appeal... It's not like it's being denied. Like, you know what I mean? Like, there's a first time for everything. I'm glad someone did this. I'm not saying it will happen every time. I don't think John Jones will win, for example, but that's just me. But Barnett had the paper trail. He proved it. The arbitrator agreed, and that's it. Good for him. It's the first. What does that mean down the road for Barnett? I mean... Obviously, it means he's eligible to compete. The question is whether he wants to. I think he wants to, but he's been suspended for a little bit. I don't know who you put him up against next. I mean, I don't want to say the division's passed him by, but there's some scary, scary people in the number that he used to be in in that weight division. Yeah, I'm thinking about fights like Francis Nagano versus Josh Barnett, and I don't think I would like the outcome. No. I think no, we'd scary. be looking at what happened to Dej when he got decked by Miato. Remember, oh, remember what Nagano yeah. did to Overeem? Uh, probably yeah. a repeat of that. Yeah, I don't want that. Ooh, it, no. I think they're still looking for his shoes or something. It's just ugh. he went into orbit. His shoes and socks were left behind. Now, are we getting more excited for the uh, the Mir Fedor fight? Because I know. There was some talk where um, Bader was saying how beating Fedor in the finals would be a dream. Well, it I'd would say be a keep... dream, but keep dreaming because you got to yeah. assume that Fedor is getting all the way to the finals. Plus, you have to win your fights as well, bud. Don't yeah. look to the finals. I mean, King Mo's like, you're thinking finals? Really? I'm right here. I'm right here. <laughs> exactly. If I was King Mo, I'd be taking that personal right about now. Maybe I'll get to ask him about that. Uh, Kamaru Usman against Santiago Ponzibibo, official for UFC Chile. Yeah, still one of my favorite promos of 2017. I'm <laughs> a problem! You are, Kamaru. You are a problem for everybody in that division. You are the real deal. I just, uh, yeah, that's probably the best way to say it. <laughs> it's just that some promos just stick with you, right? So, yeah. Just like Mark um, Henry in his John Cena retirement speech. You think it's that easy? I got a lot left in the tank. Guess who's coming back to Bellator for one night only? Sean Grandy. Mm-hmm. And he's donating his entire main fight purse 
I guess you can call it that, to Manny Rodriguez, who is suffering from a heart ailment and uh, I believe having surgery as well. So he's he's donating it to the medical fund set up to help him pay for his cost. Manny Rodriguez is Bellator's Spanish broadcaster. He, um, he, he mentioned heart issues. He's also, it's uh, diagnosed as a pulmonary embolism. Oh, yeah, that's no good. So he'll be, it'll be Grande and Big John McCarthy. And that's the show with Henderson and Huerta. We've already talked about that. Um, next Friday, Paramount Network, 9 p.m. Eastern. Now, I don't want to continue harboring this, but, uh. Harping on? Cause, well. Harboring would be taking in a fugitive. Harping would be... That's what I meant, harping. <laughs> just um, making sure. Not trying to bust your balls, but just making sure. Apparently, uh, Drew Chapman now has to worry about the California State Athletic Commission. Oh, yeah, they could levy some serious punishment on him. That is a realistic possibility. It's, um... I, I didn't even think about that, but yeah, the commission could... Could they strip him of the, uh, of his license or? Yeah. Suspend? Yeah, I guess they, they could, eh? They can strip him of his license. They can <laughs> fine him. They can refuse to accept an application to renew his license when he, when his suspension ends. They can do any number of things. Yeah. It's, it, it it's interesting to think what could ha- what could happen or what should happen. I mean, people are going to have their, um, their theories is the best way to say it. So, well, you can have your to... theory, but I have a fact, and the fact is, he knocked a guy out and did a backflip off his back. So, screw you, buddy. You deserve whatever you get after that stunt. So, one last news note here, and we'll wrap things up on this short show because of the, the uh, vacation we're on. Uh, Bellator two hundred. There's a name on there that wants to be on it, not yet, but it makes sense if he is on it. James Gallagher wants on that show. Well, he's got to be cleared from his injury because he was supposed to be in the main event of Bellator 196 fighting Adam Boric. That's another one of those many changes that I told you about. Yeah, that was... Uh, it's just a knee injury. It's, you don't rush that. Yeah, I wouldn't try to speed my way back into the fight card in London. I would... Take my sweet time, young man, and I do mean young, because he's like in his early 20s at this point, so don't rush. You're undefeated. You got your whole life ahead of you. You're already a star. Just take your time and heal up 100% and come back when you're really ready. All right, so let's move on to the main event of that show, just to get your thoughts. Rafael Caveo against Gagard Musasi. Well, obviously, it's the whole reason they signed Musasi in the first place. They're hoping that he becomes the middleweight champion because they see dollar signs in the guy as a former UFC superstar and a former Dream Champion and a former Strike Force champion. They think he's got money written all over him. Hey, money talks. That's why the I fight's mean, happening. It's the main event of one of the biggest shows of the year, and the Crow Cop Nelson fight is underneath it. I mean,. It's a good show, and what fighter wouldn't want to be on a big show? No if doubt. you don't, there's the door. <laughs> you know, that? it's funny. That's another one of those things Ed Roos said, not to give away too much of the interview, but he said, that's what you're in this sport for, to make a name for yourself and to make money. If people don't know who you are, why are you doing it? Exactly. All right, well, Stevie, what's on tap for Thursday night AMP? Well, we've got just over a week to go until WrestleMania 34, so that will be a prevalent point of discussion. We've also got two New Japan shows coming up this weekend, The Road to Sakura Genesis and Sakura Genesis on Sunday at 5.30 a.m. Eastern. So, lots of New Japan news, some WWE news. I'm sure there will be other things to discuss, like what's going on with Daniel Bryan being cleared to wrestle again and possibly having a match at WrestleMania 34, but possibly not because Shane McMahon has diverticulitis and a hernia, and he was supposed to be Brian's tag partner. So you want to hear about all this stuff, tune in to Thursday Night AMP. But if you want to hear about 
indie wrestling and wrestling interviews with stars of indie wrestling, tune in to the Wrestling Nerdcast on Tuesday night, where this week they interviewed Emil J. And if you want to hear about Impact Wrestling, tune in to the Impact Implosion every weekend on AngryMarks.com. And do you want to just throw a quick plug as well for the, uh, what do they call it again? The YouTube Apocalypse? Yes, the Sub Apocalypse. Because if you have under 1,000 subscribers, all of your videos have been stripped of the ability to get ads, which means you cannot earn money on any of your videos. So if you can do me a solid, subscribe to youtube.com slash MMF which is short for Mega Man Fan, youtube.com slash MMF187. I'm at 574 right now. If I can get to 1,000, I can turn all those ads back on. So please help a brother out. All right. Well, for Stevie J, I'm Peter Race, a hardcore Canadian. Thanks for listening. And as I always say, never leave it to the judges. Good night, everybody. See ya.